Hello, everybody. Welcome to IST 230. I'm, of course, Professor S, and this is today's lecture. Um, so first, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you the solutions for the practice problems, uh, and then we'll lecture on the rest of logic. So here are the solutions for the first 10 problems for the practice problems. And we talked about these in class. Now, this one, I uh, I don't have anything else on here, so I'll just show you how to do this. So in this case, what we're doing is we're constructing a truth table, uh, P or not Q. And so I'll just walk through my process for doing this. So first, what I do is I need to come up with my independent variables, my columns. So I know I'm going to have a P and I know I'm going to have a Q, but I don't want to have them next to each other because it's going to be P or not Q. So I want to have those two next to each other. So actually what I'm going to do, I'm going to have a column here. I put Q here and then over here I'm going to do um, P or not Q. Okay. There's no real right way for the order of these columns. It's just whatever helps you to make the most sense as long as you have the all the things that you need. And really the things that you need are is the P the Q and the P or not Q. So the two independent variables and the uh, dependent variable that's like that you're finding the, the values for. You don't need the not Q, but it helps you out. So that's why I'm doing it. All right. So anyway, so we have true, true, false, false, true, false, true, false. Got to make sure they all line up. And then I negate the Q. So it's false, true, false, true. And then here I'm going to decide based upon those first two columns, like if it's true. So it's or, so one of these has to be true. So true and false means this is true. True and true means this is true. False and false means this is false. And false and true means this is true. Because remember for or, one of the things has to be true. Okay. And anyways, that's it. That's how you do it. Anyways, let's move on to the rest of logic. So what we've done so far is we've introduced uh, propositions and we're not done with them. We're just going to take them to the next le level. The first thing that we're going to talk about is tautologies and contradictions. So tautologies are compound propositions that are always true, whereas a contradiction is a compound proposition that is never true. And I'll go through two examples of it. Um, of each of them. So first of all, we'll use the example that I gave before, the door is open. Uh, and notice then, if we negate it, the, remember that when we negate, we want to be as specific as possible, uh, and door opening is a dichotomous relationship, right? A door is either open or it's closed, okay? Um, it's not really amount of open or amount of closed, it's just it's either open or closed, right? Um, so that means if we're negating the P, then that means that would be the door is closed, right? Because the door is not open. So if it's not open, that means it's clo uh, closed because that's the only other thing that it could, like that closed could be is it's either open, closed. Okay. Anyways. Um, so we want to see, is this always true or never true? And it's going to help to illustrate with the P and the not Q or not P, excuse me. Uh, so for the first one, we have P and not P. And then the next one, we have P or not P. And if we look at the truth table for uh, the P and not P, that's always false. So that's a contradiction. And so it kind of makes sense because as I, we said in class, you can't have a door that's both open and closed at the same time, right? It's the dichotomous relationship of the door that prevents it from being that way. And so we can see that in this truth table here. Likewise, when we say the um, P or not P, it's got to be one of them. So that means it will always be true. So that's a tautology, right? Something that's always true. And so these are, this is the simplest examples of both a well contradiction and tautology respectively. Now, as I said before, what we can use truth tables for is showing uh, equivalence. So I'm going to show how not P or so, sorry, how not P and Q 
uh, and not P or not Q are the same thing. So here what I'll do is I'll make my table. Here's my P, here's my Q, here's my P and Q, right? So that means uh, true, false, 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 right? And then the next one is not P or the negation of this, right? Because it's the negation of P and Q. So it's uh, fall, uh, excuse me, false, true, 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 right? And so then we look at the net. What we want to show is like not P or not Q. So we need to find out what not P is. So looking at P, we have true, true, false, false. So that means not P would be false, false, true, true, right? And so then likewise, not Q would be false, true, false, true, right? And so then we look at those last two columns to determine not P or not Q. And we have, uh, let's see, false, uh, true, 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 right? And so since these two columns are the same, hold on, this column and this column are the same, then that means that this is, um, they're logically equivalent, right? And when we're talking about the same, look at each one of these lines. Each one of the lines gives the same value for both the P and the, the Q. Right. And so really for this table, we only need four columns, but like those other three are super helpful. OK. Um, and so then what we would say to this is they are logically equivalent. Now, Boolean algebra, somebody had uh, pointed out that there is a similarity between Boolean algebra and logic. Um, and so we can kind of use Boolean algebra to kind of help explain some of the things. I don't know. I think like Boolean algebra, it's kind of a helpful way to kind of simplify some of the um, way that we see logic. So I'm just going to show you, we're just going to do a little bit of it and you'll see what I'm talking about. So first of all, when we're talking about complements, we're talking about negation. That's what we, that's the, how it switches off in Boolean algebra. Cause it's either a zero or a one. There's no negatives. It's just complement. So that's the opposite value. So if it's a one, it's a zero. If it's a zero, it's a one. Anyways, when you think about multiplication, think about like what we know about multiplication, right? So zeros, when we're multiplying zeros and ones. So notice that when we're multiplying zeros and ones, and it's just zeros and ones, we always get zero unless it's two ones that we're multiplying together or a bunch of ones multiplying together, right? Um, but when we're multiplying two numbers together, it's always going to be zero if there's a zero present, right? And so that's very similar to our logical and where we have, uh, if we make zero kind of the same thing as false and true being the same as one, right? And so as you can see on the screen here, that the, um, the multiplication and the and are very similar. Um, so here's the similar sort of uh, table for multiplication. Now, addition is very similar to uh, integer addition. I mean, integer multiplication, this worked. It's just instead of any other numbers, it's just zeros and ones. But that's always like if we're just working with zeros and ones, it would always be that, right? One times one is always one. One times zero is always zero. Zero times one is always zero. And zero times zero is always zero. But addition, there's one exception, and that's one plus one. In this case, Boolean algebra, it is one, okay? In which case, that means that the Boolean addition is very similar to the logical or. Now, the thing that I want you to be able to take away from this is that if I give you an expression like this and I tell you like what each of those variables equals, either a 1 or a 0, like w and x are equal to 1 and z and y are equal to 0, and, and uh, yeah, z and y uh, are equal to 0, then you should be able to plug those numbers in and get that answer. Just remember that with the complement, it's kind of like those those lines over it, that's the complement. So like for instance, whatever, like where it's the complement of, of wy, it's the opposite of whatever that product is. Okay, it's a grouping operator. Now, as far as order concerns, um, order of operations comes into play. So multiplication takes precedence over uh, addition. Um, and the when you're doing that um, 
the complement operation, you do everything underneath it first before you find its complement. You don't just spread it out. Okay. There is kind of ways that you can, uh, thinking about De Morgan's law, but like, um, that's, uh, really you're better off just solving what's under there and then finding the opposite. Um, and then parentheses can be used to override precedence rules. So just keep in mind order of operations. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about predicates. So predicates is a logical statement with a truth value of a function of one or more variables. The idea is, it's like with these predicates, is that they're propositions, but they have variable truth values depending upon what thing they're talking about. Okay. Um, and the, the pool of possible things that we're talking about is called the domain. It's a set of all the possible values for that variable. So if I have the uh, predicate statement P of X, where X likes a car uh, carbonated water, then we could come up with some different things for it. Before we get into some examples of doing it, the things that are tied to predicates are a thing called quantifiers. Now, quantifiers, we have two of them. We have... Uh, this upside down A, which is for all, and then we have this backwards E, which is there exists. So the universal is the first, existential is the second. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the domain C as the set of students in the classroom. Now we haven't talked about set theory yet, but um, we will. And I, I, I just use this to be exact. So if you don't, if it doesn't make sense to you, don't worry as much to the um, with the set thing focus on the quantifiers and the predicates, okay? Um, so like, for example, if I say everyone in the classroom likes carbonated water, then we would translate to say, uh, for every x, p of x is true, is like kind of what we'd say. And now, as I was saying with the set theory, the more exact way is to emphasize that um, x is coming from the set c, and so this is kind of just a more exact way to say it, but don't really worry about this way of saying it. Just focus on for every x, p of x is true. Okay. Likewise, think about what it would be is there's somebody who doesn't like carbonated water. That would be this one, existential quantifier x, uh, not p of x. I read it as there exists an x such that not p of x is true. And if we wanted to add that set uh, C in there, it'd be there exists an X in C such that not P of X is true. Here's some more examples. We're going to focus on uh, these woodland critters. So the domain is all the woodland critters. Okay. And so if we think of P of X, where X sings a happy tune with a strange lady, then Q of X would be steals picnic food. Um, so anyways, for the first one, there is a woodland critter who sings and steals picnic food. Think about what that could be. There is a woodland critter who sings and steals picnic food. So there's a creature that bo does both of those things. It's not saying there's only one. It's saying there's at least one, right? So it'd be this um, expression right here. There exists an X such that P of X and Q of X is true. Uh, if we want to show have that uh, set in their W, it'd be there exists an X in W such that P of X and Q of X is true. Here's another one. All the critters who steal food are not singing happy tunes. In which case, think about, is it saying everybody is not stealing food and um, not, or is it saying everybody's stealing food and not singing happy tunes? No, the only ones, that it, the only thing it's saying are the people, the critters that are stealing the food are the ones not singing happy tunes, right? Perhaps because they're busy uh, stealing food. So this would be the conditional is the operator. And so this would be for every X, Q of X implies not P of X. Okay. And then for here, we have for every X, there is a, in W, P of X implies not uh Q of X implies not P of X. Sorry, I can't talk. All right. Moving on. Now, hopefully you're comfortable with quantifiers because we're going to take it up a notch to nested quantifiers. We're going to have multiple ones. Um, so for multiple quantified statements, uh, here's some tips for reading it. Uh, for every X and for every Y, 
there exists an X and a Y, or there exists an X and there exists a Y. That also works. This one is for every X, uh, there is a Y. And this one is there is a Y for every X. Now those do sound very similar, but they're not the same thing. Let me give you an example. So here what we're going to do is like we're going to work with the expression x plus y equals zero, and we're going to use those quantifiers to help uh, talk about it. So the x plus y is equal to zero is our predicate. And our quantifiers, like in this case, are there ex uh, for every x and for every y. And so if you think about this, this is saying that every x and every y, when you add them together, they get zero. Is that true? Hopefully you're saying no, because here's an example. 5 and 4 does not equal zero. Okay, now does this mean that uh, for every x and for every y uh, means that the predicate will be false? No, it means in this case it is. Let's go to another one. So there exists an x and there exists a y such that x plus y is zero. So can we come up with an x and come up with a y to make that true? Sure. How about five and negative five? That equals zero, right? Now let's turn it up a notch. For every x, there is a y. So if we have any integer, is there another integer that we can pair with it so that when we add them together, it's zero? That's absolutely true, right? So any integer I give you, you can come up with a uh, another integer that when you add it to it, it'll be zero, right? So if it's positive, you can come up with the negative version of that number. And if it's zero, you can just add zero to it and it will still be zero. Those are all integers. Last example for the slide, there exists an x for every y such that x plus y is zero. Now you might be inclined to think it's kind of the same thing as the last one where for every x there is a y, but that's not what it's saying. This is saying that there is one x that works with every y. And that's not true. Um, like there's, there's no x that you can come up with so that when you add it to zero or add it to... Um, there's not one integer that exists that when you add it to all integers, it equals zero. So it, this one's false. So notice the last two are different. Okay. Now think about this one. For every x and for every y, there is a z such that z is equal to x over y. Is this true? Well, think about it this way. Is there an example to show that it's false? What kind of, which variable would you focus on? I'll let you think about that one. Anyways, we're going to focus a little bit more on negation. I kind of hinted at that in the last class. But the idea is, is like you want to be as deep as possible. Um, and it could mean as, uh, as going into the propositions of predicates. And it also means uh, negating quantifiers when we, um, when we switch them. So like a uh, universal becomes existential and existential becomes universal. Okay, let's go through some examples. So here we're going to do De Morgan's Law, and we have um, the negation of P and Q would be not P or not Q, right? We, we talked about that, it, like I just did the uh, truth table for it. Remember, it's they're logically equivalent. Um, anyways, here's another one. Uh, not... Uh, for every x, p of x is true. Now remember, we got to simplify this and go as far, far as we can. Now we don't know what p of x is, so that's what we're going to negate. But we have you never leave it in the form where you're negating the quantifier. The quantifier will always be switched and it will be the predicate or further like into the predicate. Like if you could say like the predicate's like um, a door is shut or something like that. And so depending upon what door is shut will depend upon if it's true. But if you don't, know that that's the predicate, then you just say not whatever the predicate is. Okay, so in this case, it would be for uh, there exists an x such that not p of x is true. Similarly, think about what this would be. We don't know what p of x is, so we're just switching the quantifier and then negating the predicate, just like the one before it. What do you think not not p would be? It's a double negative, so it'd be just p. What about not not p of x? It'd just be p of x. Once again, double negative. Now, slightly harder. Uh, the negation of for every x, p of x, y, for every x and for every y, p of x, y is true. The negation of that would be, 
there exists an x and there exists a y such that not p of x, y is true. Now, even harder, so there exists an x in, for every y such that p of x, y is true. So the negation of that would be for every x there exists a y such that not p of x, y is true. Okay? Now you may be asking yourself, well, how do we know what these negations are? And the idea is, is like you got to work through the truth tables to find that. Okay? Just like we did here. The you got to just kind of work backwards. Like so for instance, if we're negating p of p and q, then we find out what p and q is and the negation of that would be false, true, true, true. So what expression could we come up with that gets that same expression? Uh, that's not exactly that one. Um, and notice that there's three, um, three truths and a false. What also has three truths and a false? An or, right? So somehow there's probably going to be an or involved in it. Okay. If there's just one uh, truth and three false, then it's probably an and. Okay. Anyways, now what we're going to do is we're going to slip into something that's a little different, similar to Inception, but what I like to call Mathception. See, the thing is, it's like, remember how Inception, where you got a dream inside a dream inside a dream inside a burrito that, anyways, I, I digress. What we're going to be doing is we're going to apply the logic to logic itself. So suppose, like, think about like a, the conditional statement, okay? Um, that, um, so what we're trying to do is think of all the instances where P implies Q. And so notice that when P implies Q, the only time that that condition is false is when Q is false and P is true. So what we're going to do is we're going to look for all the instances that are hypothesis, the values of P, um, are true and see if there's any instances where Q is false. If it's false, then there are, are, it's, our statement's invalid, right? And it's because P implied Q is false. If that never happens, then it's considered to be true. So once again, uh, an argument is valid when the conclusion is true, when all the hypotheses are true, when all the values of P are true, and uh, there's no value of Q for any of those instances to being false, then that means the statement is true. Uh, if n is an odd integer, then n squared is an odd integer. And so what we would do is come up with, in order to show that this is true, show that um, for ev like all the instances of n being an odd integer, when we square it, it's also still an odd integer and it's never even. Okay? All right. So kind of a simpler one. Uh, we'll do p unicorns eat clown shoes and q is pigs fly. So if we say unicorns eat clown shoes or pigs fly, um, and pigs fly are true, can we safely conclude that unicorns eat clown shoes? So if we know that unicorns eat clown shoes or pigs fly, and we know pigs fly, is it safe for us to conclude that unicorns eat clown shoes? It's kind of weird, but so just maybe focus on the the pre, um, the compound proposition. So we have uh, p or q. And the next one is just Q. So if P or Q is true and Q is true, can we safely say that that means that P is true? And the way that we show this is with this table right here. There it is. And that is the truth table, right? And so notice that the, the things that we're um, concerned with are P or Q and Q. So we have the table and we want to look at those last two rows. And we want to know all the rows in which it is true. And that would be this one and this one, right? Because notice that the last two columns are both true in that case. And it's not true for the any other um, rows because in the second one from the top, we have false true. So false for Q and P or Q would be true. So since they're not both true, that that's not one that we're considering. And since they're both false, that's not one that we're considering. So anyways, so we look at these and we try to determine, is there an instance where P is false? And it is. On that second line, or second one that we selected, this one right here, notice that we have it false right here, right? So that means that the statement is invalid. 
Okay. Now I'm going to change things up a little bit and we're going to do another one where it's P or Q implies R and P is true. So if we know those two things are true, is it safe to, to assume that R is true? So first thing that we have to do is come up with our truth table for this. And since we're working with uh, three independent variables, and that means we need eight rows. And so here's the P, the Q, the R. And then here I'll do P or Q. That's right here. And then it's kind of easy to do the implies R because the only, remember with the um, conditional here is that it's only false when the first one's true and the second one's false, right? So these are all true. So really it's, because remember we're trying to show that when this is false uh, and this is true, that's when it's, it's uh, uh, false. So um, let's kind of map these out. So this is an instance of it being false. This is an instance of it being false. And this is an instance of it being false. All the other ones should be true. So when I do this, notice that for each one of those lines, it's false. And so we do true, false, true, false, true, false, true, true. Okay. And so now what we'll do is we'll kind of look to see what are the rows in which um, yeah, let me kind of erase the, let me kind of erase the thing. So there we go. Um, so we have, uh, this row is where P or Q implies R is true and P is true. And then we need another one. We'll see if there's any more that, um, both, both of these are true simultaneously. Um, and so that would be this one. Oh, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. That would be that second one there too. And then that's it, right? Because they're, they're never the same. They're never true, both true at the same time. So we have P or Q and P. So that would be false. Yeah. It's like false the rest of the time. So then what we look at, is there any instance where R is false for any one of those? And it's not because there's only two things that we're looking at, two rows that we're looking at, and all those instances R is true. So that means that this statement is valid. Okay. What I want you to do is think about it. Go over the Zy books if you need to. In class, we'll go over these uh, practice problems when we get back from the weekend. Um, but for now, give it a try. I know that last part's kind of a challenging or is challenging, but you got this. We'll go over it in class, uh, and then I'll provide the answers in the, um, whatever it's called, the video. Anyways, I think that's good for today. See y'all later. Bye. Hey everyone, hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please press the like button below. It lets me know I'm doing something right. If you have any questions about any of the content, please send a message to both me and the rest of the teaching team in Canvas, and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Don't send it through normal email, you will not get a fast response. If you have any suggestions for how I can make these videos better, please leave in the comments below. Don't forget to roundhouse kick the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified for the next video. Anyways, I think that's good for now. See y'all later. Bye.